Um, another point, sound diplomacy shouldn't be confused with international scientific cooperation. They're close, but they're not equivalent. Sorry. Um, uh, there is something, I don't know if you can see, our, it's very uh, awkward, you see, I've drawn two circles, two sets which interact, which intersect, but um, not totally. What is, what is interesting is to look at the, uh, here. You can have international scientific cooperation which is not science diplomacy. It means that when scientists from different countries, they cooperate, they have common project, research project, and there is no national interest involved. There is no um, sovereignty stake uh, there. Or also, uh, when companies, big companies having research centers um, for industrial research, when they cooperate on specific aspects of industrial research, well, uh, we cannot say that the national interest is really visible. So you can have uh, this uh, sort of situation where international, international scientific cooperation doesn't fit within the frame of science diplomacy. And then there are also some situations where science diplomacy may happen without international scientific cooperation. Just think about the attractiveness policies. You know what happened when the, you know, the U USSR collapsed uh, in 1991? Some Western countries, American, but not only the Americans, you know, they went to Russia to try to hire very good scientists there to say, come, come to us. We'll pay you 50 times more. Come to us. To attract them, to have them, to succeed, to, uh, to favor the, the brain drain, you see. And diplomats were part of this. Their embassies were part of this for contacting labs, for, uh, you know, negotiating with people, trying to have them coming to the US, but not only to the US, to other Western countries as well. So uh, this is scientific diplomacy because diplomats are fully involved in this. This is not cooperation. This is a one-way relationship. This is not a both-way relationship that you could expect in any uh, situation of cooperation, of course. So uh, you shouldn't confuse the two. So to finish with this very long introduction, I hope to be uh, fast to go faster. You have to check me, uh, <laughs> to check the time. Merci. Um, what is sound diplomacy? A set of practices. First, diplomacy, sound diplomacy is some, at the beginning something professional. Something professional. It doesn't came, it doesn't came from uh, it didn't come from universities, from scholars, from academia. It came from the practice. So uh, this is a set of practices. This is also a label that you can give to some public policies. This is sound diplomacy. You name this kind of policy sound diplomacy. Um, that's the thing. This is also a, a discourse. There is a narrative about sound diplomacy. Many stories as Peter Tindemann said, inflation of stories maybe about science diplomacy. Then this is a concept. When scholars or analysts took this uh, science diplomacy as an object of study, trying to conceptualize, to analyze it. And it became a subject of academic studies where you have mostly people, history, historians, uh, specialists of science studies, um, of international relations, of sociology, and some others also, mostly from humanities, social sciences, that uh, developed um, what we could call the science of science diplomacy. Um, I will go faster. This is a more historical part, but I know that Professor Tocchetti will speak about history uh, later on. Um, is it new? Well, in a word, I would say this. The expression science diplomacy is new. The voca vocabulary is, is new. But we have um, seen for long, we have seen uh, practices where the interest of foreign affairs and of sciences could uh, combine. Uh, in the great exploratory voyage, for instance, of the, of the 18th century, 
you see? Those mission, James Cook. I took here um, a few of um, the voyage of uh, Nicola Bodin, which is less known. But you know, one of these two boats departed from the city I'm from, from Le Havre, the harbor city. So they went to um, uh, the very south near Tasmania for making exploration, discover new territories. But one of their objectives was also to get there before the British. That was the idea. So, uh, and if you remember uh, all the voyage uh, that took place near the, near the Bering, Bering Straits, the Bering Straits has a geostrategic uh, meaning, importance. So, uh, not surprisingly, all those James Cook and many others, La Pérouse and others, uh, voyage uh, were di directed to find you know, the way in order to join the Americas and so on. Colonization is also interesting. Uh, this uh, allows me uh, to uh, highlight that social senses are important in foreign affairs, and especially in colonization. Colonial uh, empires from Europe relied upon the works of geographers and also archaeologists, you know, to um, settle and to uh, strengthen their presence in their colonies. So uh, don't think that uh, in science diplomacy only hard sciences are involved. Social sciences interact also with diplomacy. And uh, it's quite interesting to, to know that in my country, in France, the archaeological research is funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not by funding agencies or, or by the Ministry of Higher Education. This is an exception. This is something unique. But this shows the close interest that diplomats have in archaeology. The archaeologists share with diplomats the, uh, their curiosity about territories, their knowledge of the field, uh, and it's quite helpful for diplomats, you know, uh, it was helpful at that time during the colonial period to, to manage and to, uh, to discuss from empire to empire how to divide the uh, Middle East and so on and so. They helped, uh, they, they relied partly on what archaeologists said. The Cold War is also an interesting period in the past. I mean, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Um, I just mentioned this very famous Russell Einstein, Einstein manifesto, Russell, uh, Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, mathematician uh, from uh, Great Britain and Albert Einstein. Uh, they issued in 1955 this manifesto, which was signed by other scientists, 11 top scientists, in order to warn about the danger of the uh, nuclear weapons to draw attention on uh, the risks to develop nuclear weapons. We were in the very cold period of the Cold War. And uh, two years uh, later, this uh, manifesto uh, translated into a first conference, which was dedicated to uh, science and world affairs which is exactly the topic of today, science and world affairs. So this conference took place in Pogwash. Pogwash is a small city in Nova Scotia in the east, eastern part of uh, Canada. And it took place there because you know, the, the main sponsor, Cyrus Eaton, was uh, from, from this place. He wanted, you know, uh, he, he was a banker and philanthropist, and he could fund this. More, more interesting is to uh, recall that the Pogwash movement has been existing uh, since then. You may have heard of this. This is a non-governmental organization which um, influences, tries to influence um, the uh, international agenda in the direction of peace, in the direction of diminishing uh, the use of nuclear uh, armaments and uh, weapons and so on. And uh, for that reason, the Pagwash movement got the Nobel Prize for Peace in 1995. So this is not new, but there are things which are new in, um, in today's science diplomacy. I wouldn't say that science diplomacy is something which has been existing for centuries. 
The idea of sound diplomacy, as expressed today in today's vocabulary, is to highlight specific things. First, what is new is that some countries, and they are more and more numerous, um, has made of sound diplomacy a claimed aspect of their foreign policy. They um, have an assumed approach of this. We know two uh, pioneering countries, we are the US and the UK, but other countries also uh, do that. Germany, Japan, Italy, Switzerland, China, France. What does it mean? If you have a strategy, an official strategy of sound diplomacy at the government level first, and second, if you give um, means to these resources, if you allocate resources, especially uh, human resources, to such a strategy, then you can consider that the country is claiming to have a, 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 a policy in the field of sound diplomacy. I don't really know about Brazil. I um, hope to profit by my staying there to, to, to know more about what Brazil does uh, in that respect. Though this is new. This is an open, openly uh, spoken strategy. Then, what is new, of course, well, not that new, you know, the concern about global issues. Uh, of course, uh, human health has been a concern for centuries and centuries. But most recently, uh, concerns have um, developed about environment, climate, uh, international security, etc. 30 years, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, the starting point. And uh, this has to do with science diplomacy. This has to do with science diplomacy. Because such challenges require diplomacy, require negotiation to find solutions. No country can tackle global challenges alone. So diplomacy is necessary. But science is also necessary. So global uh, issues, having a scientific content, this is another reason uh, of the contemporary uh, interest in science diplomacy. Scientists often act as whistleblowers. You know what is whistleblower? You know, they say, well, something is going wrong uh, with the ocean, more and more acid in the ocean, for instance. Or uh, something is going wrong, wrong because the biodiversity is diminishing. Only scientists can bring this message forward. And then politicians and diplomats have to cope with this. And scientific expertise is also there. Um, I also spoke about the science policy interf interfaces with the IPCC. Uh, other exist. Here, here are very um, well-known science policy interfaces, that is panels, international panels of scientists. You need hundreds of experts to draw reports of, on what's going on with climate or, or, or what's going on with biodiversity. This one was created in 2012, the Intergo Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity, etc., etc., under the auspices of the Na United Nations. So um, this is a response to uh, the concern about global issues. Uh, another contemporary aspect Today's diplomacy is not like the diplomacy of yesterday. Today's diplomacy integrates, much more than before, non-state actors. It's more integrative. Diplomacy is a state concern because diplomacy and sovereignty are the key words here. But non-state actors more and more are part of it, and especially the scientific community. And lastly, um, another aspect to mention about the uh, contemporary interest in science diplomacy, of course, is the importance of soft power. Soft power, you heard about that, I guess, is typically uh, something of the post-Cold War period. You know Joseph Nye, uh, he invented and disseminated this uh, soft, uh, soft power concept, uh, the idea being that countries wanted to exert power have to be more subtle, you know, more smart, uh, 
and uh, to use soft power and not only hard power. Soft power is seduction. Soft power is having people uh, loving you, you know, in other countries. They have to admire you. They have to respect you. They have to uh, find your models interesting for them. This is soft power. And uh, science is really an instrument of soft power. Look at this um, survey, which was made in 2013. Um, they, uh, they asked people in Latin America and in Africa. They asked people, and the question was, um, supposing that you admire the, um, the United States, supposing, what would be the first reason to admire the United States? First reason, scientific and technological advances. And then, second, only second, the music and the movies and Hollywood and so on. So science is the first answer. Well, these countries could be admired or respected because it is a strong scientific country. But more interestingly, if you asked the same people about the Chinese, the first answer is the same. And we do know that the, you know, the scientific power of China is, you know, is increasing very fast, but still <coughs> lagging behind the, the, the power, the scientific power of the uh, United States. But in both cases, you ask people, and they say, well, science, really, we trust science. We call that scientists are on the top of trustable and reliable people. That's the same idea. So it's interesting to rely on science as, as a soft power instrument. It's a good way of influencing. Because don't, don't forget, soft power, this is power. This is a way of expressing power of a country over all the other countries. Um, according to the standard definition, just to Five minutes, okay. According to the standard definition, the main goals of uh, science diplomacy to the standard definition is to reduce geopolitical tensions or to tackle global challenges. The mainstream message is this. And according to the standard definition, the privileged means of action is international scientific collaboration. Now, I would like in the uh, last five minutes to, um, you know, to get uh, some distance, to take some distance with this uh, um, conclusion. What are the drivers of science diplomacy? I think that there are three drivers, cooperation, attraction, and influence. Uh, it's easy to understand what is cooperation, international scientific cooperation, which is a part of science diplomacy, if not all science diplomacy, a part of it. <laughs> Countries sign bilateral science and technology agreements, country to country agreements to support cooperation of scientists. Countries together big, uh, build big science infrastructures, the ITER, program, but also the European Center of Nuclear Research, the SISAMI project, somebody will speak on, about that, Professor Rabinovich will speak on SISAMI soon, the International um, Space Station and so on and so. So these are achievements of big science, international scientific cooperation. And the result of this is that international co-publications increase in the uh, scientific literature, the size, the, the, the importance of co-published, uh, co-authored uh, uh, papers by scientists of different countries is rapidly increasing. What is attraction? Attraction is accessing foreign scientific resources. This is another driver of science diplomacy. I mentioned brain drain before, uh, but um, attraction is all the diplomatic strategies, you know, to have doctoral students from other countries to come in the country for studying, to have researchers of other countries to settle in the country, giving scholarships, fellowships, and so on. Um, attraction is also uh, 
participating in international scientific network, well, but also hosting international scientific bodies. For a country, it's interesting. This is why it's sometimes tough. The discussion between diplomacy is tough. Uh, we have the project to, to build a big research infrastructure together. But where to put it? Then this is the tension. So hosting uh, an international scientific body, as U France has UNESCO, uh, ITER, uh, Germany has the platform on biodiversity, uh, Vienna has the International uh, Agency for Energy, and so and so. And keeping contact with scientific diasporas. That's also a part of the attraction um, policy. And influence. Last uh, driver, influence. Influence is uh, not easy to, um, to define, but influence in the uh, country to country relationship uh, takes place when a country is able to weigh, on, weigh in on the decision of other country. You influence them so that their behavior comes to your uh, desire. Soft power of science, we spoke here, but having its national in international scientific organization is interesting for exerting influence. So there's a competition for having, you know, for uh, having soft position uh, between countries. Uh, having national, its national as international experts is also something which brings influence because when you have your experts abroad, they promote abroad uh, your best practices, your standards, and this is a way of influence. And keeping uh, in touch with uh, alumni and researchers, uh, foreign researchers that came to the country and went back home or somewhere else, keeping contact with them, uh, foreign students abroad, former foreign students, is also a way of influencing. Um, I sum up this, the drivers of science diplomacy, um, attraction, cooperation, influence. So, uh, and I would, the message is that any strategy of science diplomacy is a mix of this, a combination of this. Uh, attractiveness policy obviously are on, on the pole of attraction. Um, expertise, sending its national experts abroad, is on the, on the pole of influence. Um, tackling global public goods, negotiating. Uh, well, you need to cooperate, or need to collaborate, to discuss. We are on the field of, of cooperation. Uh, hosting large research infrastructure. Well, this is for cooperation, because they are mutual instruments, but as I mentioned, is also something which brings um, advantages to the country. Uh, alumni, keeping in touch with alumni, you know, uh, foreign students, when they go abroad, you can consider them as ambassador of the country where they, they were educated. So uh, it's interesting to keep in touch, to keep contact with them. Uh, France has created a platform, France Alumni, uh, the Germans have the alumni portal uh, Deutschland, just to try to, to, to trace, you know, to follow where are they. We keep contact with them because they are a vector of our influence abroad. And the uh, H2020 program, I mentioned them. I will finish uh, in two minutes, if you will allow me, uh, to, um, from this to highlight the dual nature of sound diplomacy. Uh, the dual natures, which comes from the uh, two something which may be contradictory, but not always contradictory. Countries must agree. They must discuss, they must find common solutions, uh, and they must cooperate. And uh, even more than, uh, you know, we have those global challenges. But at the same time, I, as I mentioned since, I've been mentioning since the beginning, they have to, um, take into account their national interests. So how to combine those two, you know? Well, I, you can combine this uh, by considering that um, science diplomacy can be collaborative, but can be also competitive. Collaborative science diplomacy means that collaborating 
um, on scientific projects with other countries, of course, brings scientific advantages, which is the minimum that you can expect. You know, you, you have a program with other countries, so you, you, you expect some scientific result. But collaboration brings also non-scientific benefits. Okay, non-scientific benefits. And even from the point of view of diplomats, it could be that diplomats consider that collaborating whatever the scientific field, this is the goal, you know. You collaborate, that means that you speak together, you have bridges with others. So, um, non-scientific benefits. So the key words in this approach that you find in the comments, trust, bridge, bridge building, uh, looking for peace, uh, science, collaboration in science, as a way of improving uh, the status of uh, international relations, etc. But competitive science diplomacy also exists. And uh, it is a zero-sum game. A country gets something which another country doesn't get. You, know? you do not have shared benefits in competitive science diplomacy in the example of brain drain and brain gain. So we could consider that science diplomacy um, um, deserves a larger uh, definition. Science diplomacy refers to interactions between science and diplomacy, but coming not only from cooperation, as in the historical approach, but also from attraction and from influence uh, Motivations. I will stop there.